morning. We're here to worship this morning. Would you rise with us together as we've entered the Father's house? We commonly worship. We lay ourselves down as we seek to hear from Him. Sing together with us. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. My story isn't over, my story's just begun. The failure all to find me, cause that's what my father does. The failure all to find me, cause that's what my father does. Ooh, lay your burdens down. Ooh, here in the father's house. Check your shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, you're in the Father's house. Arrival's not the end game, the journey's where you are. Never wanted perfect, you just wanted my heart. And the story isn't over, if the story isn't good. The failure's never final when the Father's in the room. And failure's never final when the Father's in the room. Ooh, lay your burdens down. Check your shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, you're in the Father's house. Radicals come home, the helpless find home. Love is on the move when the Father's in the room. Prison doors ring wide, the dead come to life. Love is on the move when the Father's in the room. And miracles take place, the cynical find faith. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Miracle walls are quaking, strongholds now are shaking. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Ooh, lay your burdens down. Ooh, here in the Father's house. Check your shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, you're in the Father's house. Ooh, lay your burdens down. Ooh, here in the Father's house. Check your shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, you're in the Father's house. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. I have taken an oath and confirmed it, that I will follow your righteous laws. I have suffered much. Preserve my life, Lord, according to your word. Accept, Lord, the willing praise of my mouth, and teach me your laws. Though I constantly take my life in my hands, I will not forget your law. The wicked have set a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your precepts. Your statues are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. My heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. Hold 
my troubles seem so tall and all my faith just feels so small but I will sing through rise and fall my hope is in the Lord chase away my fears with peace you call the storm inside of Amazing love, how can it be? My hope is in the Lord. Oh, my hope is in the Lord. Like a river flowing, let me break it open. Rushing wild, it's always free and strong. Let my heart remember, I am yours forever. There's no end to the song, your love goes on and on and on and on, on and on and on and on. Never fail in you each day, you're always true and will not change, forevermore my soul. Rushing wild, it's always free and strong. Let my heart remember, I am yours forever. There's no end to the song, your love. that never leaves us or forsakes us. And it's through his word, as we're going to talk about today, that we find that love. It's through his word we hope and believe in. Let's continue to worship. Did we ever want 
walk alone Never once did you leave us on our own You are faithful, God, you are faithful Feeling on this battleground Seeing just how much you and struggles on the way but with joy our hearts can sing yes our hearts can sing never once did we ever walk alone never once did you leave us on our own and you are faithful Every step we are breathing in your grace And evermore we'll be breathing out your grace You are faithful, God, you are faithful You are faithful, God, you are faithful Scars and struggles on the way but with joy our hearts can sing Never once did we ever walk alone Carried by your constant grace Held within your perfect peace Never once, no we never walked alone Never once did we ever walk alone? And never once did you leave us on our own. And you are faithful, God, you are faithful. With every step we are breathing in your grace. And evermore we'll be breathing out your grace. together this morning. Father, as we come in this place and we cry out, you are faithful. Sometimes it doesn't feel that way. Sometimes it may seem like we're alone. Maybe if we look back at our past, Father, we think about times when we walked a path or we went somewhere and we feel like we were alone, God, but in reality, you were always there. And it's not the fact that you aren't there with us, it's the fact that sometimes we lack the, the foresight or we, we, we lack the, the ability to be able to see you, to see your presence, to see your hand at work. God, as we look towards the future, perhaps there are difficult days ahead. Maybe there's celebrations ahead and everything in between, God, but we once again recognize the fact that you are faithful. May that be in some ways one of the greatest answers to prayer that any of us have, God. Are you listening? Are you there? Answer this prayer. And in essence, in a lot of ways, you simply answer by simply being there, wrapping your arms around us, giving us your devotion, your love, a peace and a hope that only you can grant. And so, God, as we gather in this place corporately and even join online, Father, in one accord, as we engage together through song, through worship in different manners, but in particularly in this song and this idea, this concept, may we recognize that you are faithful. May that bring us hope and discouragement. May that bring reconciliation and broken relationships. May that bring provision in places where we fall short or where we don't have the resource or the energy. May that bring healing to the broken the sick or the afflicted. As we come before you, God, we cry out 
thank you for your faithfulness, and we ask for a continuation of that in the future. God, we pray for the rest of this service, Father, and we lay it before you, asking for you to touch and to move. Pray, God, that you would move through the giving of uh, the worship of giving through tithes and offerings, God, that you would, that you would touch both the, 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 the gift of itself, but also the process of giving. May this be part of a transformative work in us and through us. May this church be one that, Father, as we touch the world around us, our own sphere of influence, even those within these walls, Father, that it would be an opportunity of an expression of your hands, your feet, your mouthpiece, your love. God, we commit this time to you, thanking you, Father, for all that you do, the provision that you grant. And may we continue to seek you. And may we also continue to see and reflect upon and experience your faithfulness. In your son's name we pray, and all of us said together, amen, amen. You may be seated if you haven't already. I want to welcome you today. Um, I'm Steve Warner. I'm blessed to serve as the lead pastor here at CCWC. And uh, this morning I have a couple of announcements I do want to share. If you're a guest or maybe you're joining us for the first time, we are so excited that you're here. We're excited uh, in recognition that uh, you chose to step out and maybe uh, it's uncomfortable or maybe it's new to you or maybe all together you just kind of don't know exactly what to do. Let me just say, most of us have been there. You step into a new place and don't know when to stand or when to sit or what to say. Uh, if in any way we can answer questions this morning, if we can engage with you, if we can even pray for you, pray with you, we would love to do so. One thing we do encourage you to do is fill out the Connect card in the seat in front of you and take it to the Information Center before you leave, because one thing we want to do beyond all that is to, to give you a gift, a way of saying we're so glad you chose to join us today. And then we're also going to make a gift in your name to our community partner, our project for the month. And this month, uh, our project is uh, a community garden, which... Uh, if you, if you saw it up on the hill, uh, you probably, um, unless you, you were looking for it, you probably missed it, but the, the garden is, is, has been turned over, it's been plowed, it's ready, and so uh, those that are going to be participating in that have already signed up. We're going to be talking about that this week and what that looks like, uh, but it's not too late. If you would like to participate, just make sure you contact us before uh, the end of the week today, or the sooner the better on that. Today would be the best um, so that we can make sure uh, that we get you in there. Just uh, uh, contact the office through email or just leave us a note today on the Connect card. A couple of things I do want to mention. Uh, one, if you look at the back of your sermon notes, you'll see there's a few announcements here. One big one is this Saturday. Um, Pastor Dave and Beth and his family um, are going to be moving on uh, to a new ministry opportunity, which is exciting. He's going to be the new regional uh, director. Uh, actually, I'm going to get that wrong executive director, regional executive director for uh, Youth for Christ in Eastern Michigan, and so excited about that. He's going to go up and be a missionary in that heathen state up north, so that'll be good uh, for him. I, t I take that back. I shouldn't have said that. Uh, I'm just kidding. We, we love our neighbors to the north, but Pastor Dave will be heading up there, and so before he goes, we want to spend some time celebrating their ministry as a family and uh, just engaging together, and so we encourage you to join us. It's going to be an open house style, so be come and go. It'll be this Saturday uh, from 5 to 8 up in the youth worship space, and so come uh, ready to join in some laughs, and uh, there will be tissues there available as well uh, for those that will need those too. Uh, you can walk down through there. You can see the rest of the items that are on the list. One other thing I do want to mention is tonight will be the last night for Sunday Night Thrive for the year. And so for kids ministry, we'll conclude tonight uh, with a concluding party. This is a, a special Sunday in the life of the church. Uh, typically, we have one of these. We did one earlier in the year because time was uh, time permitting for one of the candidates that wanted to join. But today is a day that we receive new members uh, into our congregation, and so we're excited about that, those that have stepped forward in their discipleship process uh, to affirm their commitment to the church and their commitment to what we believe and what we teach, and then additionally to step into forms of leadership as well. And so I'm going to read some introductory, introductory remarks as it pertains to membership, and then I'll ask the members to come forward. Dear friends, the privileges and blessings which we have within the fellowship of the church of Jesus Christ are very sacred and precious. Christ so loved the church that he gave himself for it, sanctifying himself that the church might be sanctified. He chose to speak of himself as the head of the church and of the church as his body. And again, he spoke of himself as the husband and the church as his bride. Christ gave himself unselfishly, and he asked the church to share its glorious relationship with all humankind, sending it into the world to preach the scriptures 
to save the lost, to administer the sacraments, to maintain Christian fellowship and discipline, and to build up the believers until he comes again. All of us, whatever our age or position, stand in need of Christ's church and of those means of grace which it alone makes available. It is in keeping with Christ's commission to the church that we meet together now. There are some among us who testify to having been received already into spiritual fellowship to the universal church and who desire to be received into the official and visible fellowship of this local unit of the body of Christ. And at this time, I will ask those that are joining us in this service who have walked through the membership course, and those are the ones that I talk to and you know to come forward now, to come on up. Somebody's got to be the first one. Yep, there you go. We do facilitate two services here, and so we've got several that will be at each service. I'm going to ask you to come up and stand on this side over here. There's stairs here, but they're off to the side. Sorry about that. Come on up. Well, in this service, we're uh, blessed to have four of our candidates come and join. This is Edie Post, Mike D'Onofrio, and then we've got the Amoses. They are... Jeff and Lori. Sorry, I looked at you. I've, I've talked to Jeff a million times. I looked at him in the face. And I, thought, I can't remember your name. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Good. It's on the back wall. So we are good. But we're so excited to have the four of you for this service. Um, I did promise you that there wouldn't be a huge speaking part. And so I'm not going to ask you to say more than I do this morning. So there we go. These persons standing before you come to enter into covenant as members of the Wesleyan Church. With all the accompanying rights, privileges, and responsibilities, they testify to having been born again. They have received the sacrament of baptism, have been instructed in, and have accepted the doctrines and polity of the Wesleyan Church, and have been approved by vote as manifesting in spirit and practice God's work of grace within their hearts. They have each responded appropriately to the membership covenant questions as required by the discipline, and at this point have decided and determined to come forward before the church to become members of Christ Community Wesleyan. One thing I will say is uh, I have the opportunity to sit down with each candidate after we walk through the classes and those moments together, and sit down with each candidate individually or as a couple, and to hear their testimonies and hear their heart for Jesus, and it truly is encouraging. And so I'll probably say this at the end, but I want to say it now. They'll be here uh, between services. Some of them will be here after and even uh, after second service and even here for the family dinner. I encourage you to come. And even if you've known them for a long time or perhaps this is the first year you're uh, getting to meet them, ask about their story. Ask about what God's done in their life and how he's changed and transformed them because this is truly an opportunity that we have as the church to edify each other and to glorify God. By coming before us today... You indicate your purpose to publicly confess the Lord, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit to be your God and the object of your highest love. You accept the Lord Jesus to be your Redeemer and the Holy Spirit to be your sanctifier, comforter, and guide. You joyfully dedicate yourself to God that within the everlasting covenant of His grace, you might be used in His service to glorify and honor Him. And you promise to hold to him as the highest good of your lives that you will give diligent attention to the commands and principles of his word, that you will seek the honor and advancement of his kingdom, and that you forsake all ungodliness and worldly desires. You will live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. You do also purpose to join yourself to this church, submitting yourself to its principles of government, and by walking in love and fellowship with all its members, seek its peace, purity, and growth in grace. Do you freely and sincerely devote yourself to be the Lord's within fellowship of this church? If so, answer, I do. I do. The awesome thing about this is it's not a passive service or moment for you. In, va in fact, this is a place where you engage as the church. And so now I'll read to you a response that I require. May the members of the church now join in welcoming these new ones to our fellowship, assuring them of our love, of our prayers, and of our care over them in days to come. Do you, the members of this church, receive these to our communion and fellowship as beloved brothers and sisters, promise to walk with them in love, to instruct, counsel, admonish, and cherish them, and to watch over them with all long-suffering gentleness and love? And if so, answer, we do. Praise God for that. It would have been awkward if you would have said, I don't, I don't think so. 
in this moment, I want to encourage you to, to outstretch an arm if you can, as if to lay hands on these four up front as we commit this time in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reality that you have created the church, that you have given us opportunity as brothers and sisters in Christ to come together to glorify you, God, to praise you, to bring forth an opportunity to be able to worship you, God, to, to engage in sacraments, to engage in the mission of your church, to glorify your kingdom. And God, as we grow, that may this be a testament not just to the fact that we step forward through free, free will, but through your faithfulness once again, through your engagement, through your love, through the reality that, God, that you are all-powerful and that you give us the opportunity to be able to be part of your redemptive work. God, you in no way need us. You don't require us, but God, because of your love, you invite us to come along, you empower and you encourage us to do so. I pray for these four that are standing before us today, that as we engage with them moving forward, Father, whether they've been here for a long time or a short time or anything in between, Father, we pray that as a church we wrap our arms around each one, that this would be an opportunity for us to grow together, to engage with one another, to learn from each other, so that we might be able to glorify you and honor you through our fellowship with one another. In your son's name we pray, and all God's people said together once again, amen. amen. It's at this time that I have the, the blessing and the honor to be the first to offer each of you the right hand of fellowship, welcoming you to our congregation, welcoming you to our new family, and once again saying to everyone else here, welcoming them into our fold. Thank you once again. Let's show our appreciation and our engagement today. Take note of where they're sitting so you can surround them after service. You did see some additional names up on the screen there. If you'd like to come back second service and take part in the um, taking of new members second service as well, we will have some more, and we're excited about that as well. Well, this morning we continue our series. We're uh, three weeks in, which is crazy to think that we are actually... Uh, halfway through May already, and most of the teachers and uh, students in the room are saying amen. They're excited about uh, summer coming. Some of us are already thinking, wow, spring is, uh, is halfway over as well. But it's exciting to think about where we're at in this year. It's exciting to think about this series. Uh, the first week, we engaged in somewhat of an uh, apologetic lecture uh, that uh, brought forth an understanding of whether or not God can be trusted, if God even exists. And then Pastor Seth last week brought forth a, a pastoral congregational message regarding the question of understanding where suffering comes from. We're going to return back to an apologetic somewhat of a lecture this morning, and then the last two of this series will be uh, in sermon form. I want to say a, a couple things first before we even jump in. First, if you're taking notes today, this is a lot of notes. Um, some of you are laughing because you're like, yeah, Steve, I already saw that. I don't think I can write in that. One thing I do want to mention, if you're taking notes, is we do have an answer key, so to speak, at the Information Center. So if you miss one here or there, especially if you're one that needs to have every blank filled in, feel free to stop back there. Uh, if you're joining online, obviously those are already kind of filled in for you as we get going. Uh, but there's a lot of notes here. But let me just say, um, as I uh, asked Candace in the office to put this together, uh, certainly there was nothing here that I felt like we could take away because uh, in some regards, sometimes the Spirit says, here's one central point, focus on this. And then sometimes the Spirit will say, here's several things to walk through. And when it comes to the Word of God, there is no simple, easy answer response. Instead, uh, there is a, there's a lot to understand. There's a lot to know. That being said, too, as we walk through this simple question of, of asking, why should I uh, or why should I believe the Bible? Uh, the desire that I had was to walk through three things. One was to recognize that we live in a post-Christian society. And so first thing I was going to do is, and we are going to do, is walk through what is the Bible, understanding what this, this, this book is. The second thing we're going to do is talk about can we trust Scripture, and that's this concept of, of getting to the main question. Is it, is it, is it um, something that we can actually look at and say, yeah, that is what, believe, what Christians, what the church believes it is. And then finally, the third thing we're going to look at is what does Scripture have to do with me? You know, it might be a, a true book. It might be something that, yeah, it's accurate. We get that. I understand that. But how does this book that was written so long ago have any impact on my life? In life, in actuality, we all trust in something. 
You and I all choose to trust in things. You all chose to trust in sitting in the chair that you're in now, that it wouldn't break. You chose to, chose to trust in the car that you drove in or probably the person who, who drove you here this morning. You chose to trust in the fact that you can breathe in fresh air every single breath. You choose something every moment, and we all have these opportunities, these times when we choose. Some have chosen to put their trust in God, which is a, a form of trust. Others, I will say on the other end, which is probably a harder thing to do, a harder thing to, to engage in, is chose to not trust God. But whatever we trust, whether we trust today even in this book, in the Holy Scripture or not, when we trust in something, it is always a good idea to make an informed decision. Am I right there? Probably most of you made an informed decision on the chair you're sitting in because of previous experience. Or maybe you're a chair manufacturer. Is there any of those in here? Probably none. But for whatever reason, in most cases, we make an informed decision because we do research first. When you purchase a car, typically you do a little bit of research. You ask around people that might know. Maybe you go on the internet and you try to look at the, re the consumer reports. You make decisions from having informed research. And so as we walk through this, my hope today is that we would have some informed research. We'd have this opportunity to make a decision on whether or not we can trust Scripture because of the fact that we have looked deeply, taken an, an exploration or a, a, a journey through exploration and understanding of what the Bible is, how we can trust it, and how it affects or has any impact on my life. So what is the Bible? In short, the Bible, as the church defines it, and let me just make sure I make that known, as the church defines it is, uh, is interesting. The Bible, the word Bible from the Greek ta tabibla actually means the books or a library of books. It's made up of 66 books. It's not just one. While many of us have this, this hardbound or, or softbound uh, copy of the Bible, there are 66 books in there, including two testaments. So there's two larger parts, two larger sections. There's the Old Testament, which came first, and the New Testament, which came second. Testament means evidence or witness uh, or covenant in this right. This is God's covenantal evidence, witness, word for us. And there's the Old Testament and the New Testament. The 66 books in the Bible, they actually they vary in age from about 3,500 years old to 1,900 years old, written over the course of that span of time. Some of the information, especially in the Old Testament, was passed down verbally, audibly for a while until it was actually written down and, and put together in ways that we could, uh, we could read it. There's various authors within Scripture. There are men and women that took time to sit down as they were inspired by the Holy Spirit and to write the words that God had given them. There's different types of writing, many different actually, seven main ones. There's poetic writing, there's historical narrative, there's law, there's wisdom literature, there's prophecy, there's apocalyptic literature, there's gospels, there's epistles, which are letters, mostly written by Paul and some others, and then there's teaching. The original language of, of, of Scripture is threefold, primarily Hebrew and Greek, and then there's also Aramaic. And right here, you might all already be thinking, wow, it's really old, it's written by a lot of people, it's been gathered together, it's even in another language. Can I trust the Bible? The history of the Bible is interesting over the course of time. Obviously, it's got uh, quite a history in it. Uh, historical uh, uh, councils were put together where uh, religious uh, leaders would come together and they would read over the manuscripts. They would read over the different books that were being put forth as, as some that, that could be inspired. And as they came together to affirm it, they created what's called the canonized Bible. And there are a couple different canonized Bible. There's the, there's the Catholic canon, Roman Catholic Bible. There's also what we have as the Protestant Bible. 
The Protestant Reformation was an interesting time in the, in the history of the Bible, as it was a time when there was before this, there was a Catholic, Roman Catholic protection, it was as if to say, okay, it's, it's something that only we can handle, the lay person can't handle. When this Reformation came, it opened up Scripture so that all people, you and I, could have Scripture without having to have some kind of extra uh, uh, title behind our name or, or to have some specific degree. We had the opportunity to be able to, to read and to look at it. Around that same time, Gutenberg, an individual who created this thing called the printing press, was able to make the Bible readily and widely available by simply printing it over and over again rather than having to write, transcribe every single word. And then finally, at a certain point, Scripture was translated into many languages specifically for us, our first language here in this country, English which I will say can also bring forth some, some thoughts of, well, there's some ineffectiveness here because there's words in other languages that we don't have, or there's phrases that don't make sense. Well, let me just say the first point here is very important that we note, and that is that the Bible is not just a work of humanity. It's not just something where we pulled our ancestors or whoever it might be, pulled these things out of thin air, and then over the course of time was affirmed by other humans and then given to us after it was translated into English. Instead, the first point is this, the Bible is the inspired Word of God. And so the reality is over the course of time where we might look at it and say, well, things might have been, been lost here, or this might have been messed up, or what about, why did they approve this or prove that? Let me just say, it's not just a human endeavor, but the Holy Spirit has brought forth the canonized Scripture that we have today. Now, I'll talk about that more in a little bit. So, right now, you might be saying, well, that's your opinion. It, it is my opinion, but as we continue forward, we're going to kind of do some research to affirm that a little bit more. As we move forward, the Wesleyan Church statement from the Articles of Faith, chapter, or excuse me, paragraph 218 reads like this, we believe that the books of the Old Testament and New Testament constitute the Holy Scriptures. They are the inspired and infallible written Word of God, fully inerrant in their original manuscripts and superior to all human authority, and have been transmitted to the present without corruption of any essential doctrine. We believe that they contain all things necessary to salvation so that whatever is not read therein nor may be proven thereby is not to be required of any man or woman that it should be believed as an article of faith or be thought requisite or necessary to salvation. Both the Old Testament and New Testament testaments life is offered ultimately through Christ who is the only mediator between God and humanity the New Testament teaches Christians how to fulfill the moral principles of the Old Testament, calling for loving obedience to God made possible by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. We live in a culture where you might hear this phrase said or lived out through action, just live your truth. Just live your truth. If that's what you believe, just live your truth. The problem with that statement is that in a postmodern world, if we're to, in a post-Christian world, that if we are all to live our truth, we're going to have differing perspectives, differing opinions on what truth is. And so what the church has affirmed over the course of time, the understanding of what Scripture does and what place it plays, is that if there is one truth, and that truth, we believe, is, is, is engaged in Scripture, is, is, it, it is the message of Scripture for all people from God. If we believe in one truth, we all can be on the same page in understanding of who God is, what God's planned for us, and what's morally good and what's morally bad. And so the second point is this, the Bible is the one established standard that calibrates all humanity. The Bible in and of itself gives us the perspective and the understanding that we can all follow the same path. They all follow the same in, in engaging story, the same thing that God calls for all of us. So when we see something, we recognize this might be sin and this is not sin. When we see a, a, a recognition of the Spirit, we know that this is of God and this is not of God. And finally, we engage in that last point, and this, this last point is, is very important. The Bible is the foundation for reason, logic, and experience. The one who which we, um, we, we, we 
have based our theology as a church on John Wesley. Uh, he, he didn't actually create this, but it was created from his writings, this thing called the Wesleyan quadrilateral. And basically the engagement in a nutshell is that there are four specific things that you and I use as human beings, as holistic beings created by God to be able to discern right and wrong, understanding, to make decisions, whatever it might be. Three of those things are in that point. There's reason, there's logic, and there's experience. And you and I both know that if we are to engage in, in making a decision where we just use reason, or we just use logic, or we just use experience, or any combination of those three, that we're going to fall short, or we might come to a different response than we would from someone else in the exact same position. So therefore, there has to be some standard, once again, going back to point two, to help us to know and to engage in what's true and what's real, and that is the fact that these three are all based on the foundation of Scripture, of the Bible, of God's holy word for you and for me. So when we make a decision, when we engage in life, when we understand what the Bible is, we do so by recognizing that it's the inspired word of God, it's the one established standard for all of us. It's a love letter that God grants us and gives us so that we can make decisions based upon His holy word. So you might be looking at it and saying, okay, that's great. This is what the Bible has to say about itself. This is what we understand from Christian history. And, and that might be one place where you think, okay, the argument falls short. After all, you wouldn't probably walk up to somebody, you know, that you've never met before and talk with them. And, and after a couple minutes, they say, well, I'm an honest person. You say, oh, if you're an honest person, here's, here's my wallet. Hang on to this for me, right? Because they're the only one who told you they're an honest person. If, that, if we're just using the Bible as the only means to be able to determine whether or not it's true, you might say, well, the Bible can say anything it wants about itself. How do we know that it's true? However, I will say this, when exploring the Bible, there are some things that it says between the lines. As we read between the lines, it helps us to recognize its legitimacy. It helps us to recognize through its posture and the method and the type of writing that's granted there through the authors that there's probably more truth here than most people give it credit for. We're going to do a bit of a case study on some of Luke's writings, but as we walk through, we're going to engage in this question, can we trust Scripture? To answer this, I want to explore three important tests, and I'm going to give them to you real quick, and then we're going to walk through each one. The first one is the composition test. And the composition test is basically letting the speakers, the authors, speak for themselves. Here's the content, here's the information. The second one is the companion test. Knowledge about the actual scriptures, the manuscripts. Do they work together? Do they make sense together? Do the, do the passages that are written from, uh, in, in Job make sense? And, and are they, do they work in conjunction with what's in Matthew? And then finally, the corroboration test. Do other people in history say, yeah, this is true. Yeah, this makes sense. Now, I recognize you're looking at it, you might be saying, okay, as we look at the Bible and we use the Bible, this is not necessarily a tool for us to prove that the Bible is true, but there are some glaring things that stick out that help us to note and to, and to know that God is real. So the composition test, first the, the, the composition test, Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 1 through 4, it says, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. Just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught." So this is kind of an ancient way of a person who had a lot of clout. Luke was actually a physician. He had a lot of clout, a, 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 an ancient way of him saying, I'm writing down in certainty as an eyewitness that here is what happened right here, right now in the days of Jesus. Second Peter 1.16 reads, For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power but we were witnesses of his majesty. Once again, eyewitnesses of what took place. 1 John 1, 1 says, that which was from the beginning, 
which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at with our hands and touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of God. He appeases the three, these, three sentence, these three senses that, that he heard. They heard the word. They heard what was taking place. They looked at him. They also touched. They felt Jesus. These weren't stories that were passed down that they heard that, that grew uh, in, in legend as time went on. No, this is something that they actually were part of. They were engaged in. They were there. We all know what happens in a game of telephone, right? It starts with a message, something quite simple, and then as you pass it on, it kind of changes and grows as someone mishears something or as somebody thinks it's funny to add something else to it. This isn't that at all. This is simply those individuals responding to the story that they saw unfold before them. It's interesting to note, too, this, that how specific this is, and we'll get into this in just a moment, but, you know, when you're inventing a story, when you're inventing a story, you want to make sure that that story, uh, if you're, you know, making it up, make sure that story is one where you can kind of throw it out there and no one can disprove it. So you use generalizations, you use things that don't make sense. You know, you, you look at uh, the movie Star Wars, it says in a, in a place long, long ago, far, far away, it's like, okay, there's no way to disprove that it ever happened. Luke 3, 1 reads like this, in the 15th year of the, of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judah, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of, of Itria, and Trachontius, and Ly Lyanstia, tetrarch of Albaline. So right here we already see that Luke is he's paving the way for those to understand this is the exact timeline. And you can look at any other historical book, any other historical record, and recognize that this is when this happened. I, I, I would say that if Luke is attempting to try to pull the wool over the eyes of his readers, he would not make it so easy for, him, for himself and his story to be disproved. He's not saying once upon a time. He's saying here is the exact moment in time in, the, in which these things took place. He's not being vague and making up a lie and, and, and creating a place where it can be unproved. No, he wants everyone to know this is true. Another interesting fact, and this is, uh, this is almost laughable in a lot of ways, the documents contain embarrassing material. And not just embarrassing material about the adversaries, about the people that they were against, but embarrassing material about themselves. Probably most of us haven't written a lot of stories uh, narratives about ourselves, and maybe you have to think back to uh, a long time ago when you maybe were in school where you wrote a story about yourself. You usually didn't make yourself the one who is the butt of the jokes. You usually didn't make yourself the one that can easily be picked at or made fun of. But when, we make fun, when you make up, you know, a, a lie about something, you try to make yourself the hero. How many times do you and I read Scripture? And I, I can attest to this up front sometimes. How many times do we read Scripture and we dish on, we make fun of the disciples because of how they messed up, how they didn't get it? I would, I would contest to say that if the disciples were attempting to, to make up a story, they would have never made themselves the butt of the joke. They would have never showed their own mistakes. They would have never shown how they denied Jesus or how they didn't get it. They would have shown or they would have written, look how much I knew. I was such a humble person. In fact, I told Jesus, I'm going to wash your feet every single day, and they'd record that every single time. No, they wrote the truth, even when it made them look bad. They composed the truth. They didn't, they didn't care about how it made them look. In this composition test, we see that Peter denied Jesus. We see that Jesus calls Peter Satan. Would you include that if you were making it up? We see the disciples fell asleep when they were asked to pray. We see the disciples didn't care about Jesus' teachings in many cases, in Mark 4 specifically. We see that women found the tomb in John 20. Now, that is profound. Because in a story where you were making it up, you would never let the woman be the hero in the story in that time. In that time, women were, were accounted as, as low as dirt. They were property in many cases. And so while it's laughable to us today, at that point, that would have been a faux pas. That would have not been something that you would do. It would have been scandalous to say, well, the women found Jesus? The writers cared more about the truth than the impression that it would make on their character. A step further, and this is maybe even more profound, they cared more about the truth in their own lives. Peter, Andrew, and Philip were crucified. 
Bartholomew was whipped to death, James was beheaded, Matthew was killed with a sword, Matthias was stoned, Thomas was stabbed with spears, John died in exile on an island on a, alone by himself, Luke was hanged, James the just was beaten to death, and Mark was dragged to death by a horse. Would you die for something that you believe to be a lie? First point under that is this on the composition test. The writers cared more about truth than the impression of their character and even more than their lives. They didn't care how it made them look. They didn't care if it even was the, the ultimate reason of their demise, of their physical death. Instead, they stepped forward and they wrote the words because they were true and because the Spirit inspired them to do so. Thank God for, you, for that for you and for I in this time to have that truth. They're willing to put themselves in harm way because the depths of their heart for Jesus was far greater than any pain they would walk through at that time or how they would be painted in history. Let's go to the companion test, the second one there. The companion test is, 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 is looking at the documentation that we have. Have the documents reached us accurately? I talked about how there was this long path of how we came to the place where we have the approved canonized scripture for us today. And, and as I said before about this game of telephone, there is probably this likelihood where some might think, well, over the course of time, things got changed. You know, Jesus went from being a good man to being God. And how did all these things happen in there? You know, there must have been a change. There must have been some things that are different. Because if you read scripture now, you think, well, there's no way that was originally in there. Even with everything we have, even with the, with the, the, the understanding of the, what the apostles have passed down, there has to be some mess up, right? Two questions to answer to respond to this. The first one is, what's the time gap between original copies and original events? Meaning, when did they write it down versus when did the events actually happen? How close is the copy written to the events that took place before them? Generations 1, 2, and 3 and beyond. When, when, when do we have these things in time? It's interesting. Sometimes people say, well, you know, I've got this specific version of Scripture and uh, of the Bible, and, and it's, it's, it's more accurate than this other one over here, but this one is older, so this one must be wrong. And, and it's interesting, you know, if you've ever seen the movie Multiplicity, Michael Keaton, he, he makes a copy of himself, and it's, it's a clone movie, basically. It's, it's kind of a comedy. I, I only remember the premise. I actually never watched the movie, but he makes a clone of himself, and basically what happens is he does so so that he can have somebody else help him out around the house and do whatever. Else. So he makes a copy of himself, and, and once he makes the copy of himself, it's perfect, right? It's the same as him. But eventually what takes place is someone, uh, one of his copies decides he's going to make it, he wants help too, so he's going to make a copy of himself, and that copy is a little bit distorted, it's a little bit messed up. And the, the, the recognition here is that sometimes what took place over the course of, of, of transposing the Scripture is there might be a copy over here that is, that is, that is, is, is historically, chronologically, has been around longer than another. It was copied from an inferior copy, which was not correct, and therefore has some deficiencies in it. So while there might be some historical uh, precedents to say, well, this one's older, that doesn't mean that it generated from the, the, the most affirming most accurate copies. The second thing about this, this original copy, original event thing is over time we forget things, right? We remember things, you know, sometimes uh, from, from 20 years ago, we think, okay, well, I, I remember where I was. I remember, you know, who was there. For the disciples, this was recent. This was much more recent than that. In the first generation, uh, specifically, the, the gospel of John in and of itself was written just 40 years, 40 years after the, the, the accounts took place. Historically speaking, actually, this is unprecedented. And Daniel Wallace, an author, says we have, and I'll quote him, we have more and earlier manuscript evidence about the person of Jesus Christ than we do anyone else in the ancient world, including Julius Caesar and Alexander the Great. And I would contest to say that there's no doubters that these two historical figures existed. The earliest biographies of Alexander the Great were actually 800 years, written 800 years after his existence. And I would say that probably in that 800 years, he went from Alexander the Good or Alexander the Okay to Alexander the Great, right? A <laughs> second question is this, how many manuscripts do we have? This could be a good thing or a bad thing. If you've got a whole bunch of manuscripts and they don't line up, you might be in big trouble. Conventional wisdom says the more you have and the more differences you have, uh, the more you have, the more differences you're going to have in the actual manuscripts. 
So let's look at the data for just a moment. A handwritten manuscript copy before the printing press. About Caesar, there were 10 manuscripts. Plato, there were seven manuscripts. The New Testament, there were 24,000 plus manuscripts. Christians reverted to Scripture more than God in, in any other way. And the average classical writer for, for any manuscript, there's 20 copies written. 20 copies from the average one. It's about four foot high. I don't know how tall I am. How about right here? For the New Testament, if you were to pile up 24,000, it would be more than a mile high recorded manuscripts, recorded manuscripts from the earliest dates. And I know you're asking, you're thinking, but how much do they match up? 24,000, that seems like there could be a lot of mistakes. Let me tell you, there are about 3,000 to 4,000 variants within those manuscripts. And already you're starting to say, okay, all right, yep, you're slipping, Steve. I know 3,000, 4,000, that's a lot. There's probably a lot of mistakes. Let me just say, first of all, the 75% of them are spelling mistakes. There was no spell check back then, and there was also different variations, like color, in our language, is spelled C-O-L-O-R or C-O-L-O-U-R. Or gray is spelled G-R-E-Y or G-R-A-Y. Same meaning, different spelling. And in all regard, there's two passages, two passages in Scripture, just two, that we're unsure about. At the end of Mark 16 and part of John 8, and here's the deal. If you were to turn in your Scripture right now and look, both of them have a reference mark, a note that says that these two passages, or this passage is uncorroborated. It may not have been in the earliest manuscripts. So in that regard, there are two places where there may be a mistake, and the authors made sure to record that, hey, this might not have been there. Rather than hiding it, rather than just kind of glossing it over and saying, well, this is probably good enough. No, there was an, in, there was an intentional engagement. And so the second point under that one is this, the short, term, the short time gap between action and recording, along with addition of the overwhelming amount of consistent manuscripts, reveals that the present-day Bible is accurate. Finally, the third one, corroboration test. I want you to leave that, leave that slide up. There's a lot of writing on that one. Corroboration test. Do other historical materials confirm or deny the testimony provided by the document itself? Raise your hand if you didn't get that last one. Okay, quick writers, nice. So writings outside the Bible. Do writings outside the Bible prove that the Bible is true? We're not going to spend a lot of time on this one. We're just going to kind of buzz through it. Let me just say, first of all, an example. The Book of Mormon has literally nothing that lines up with historical account. In fact, for the most part, it, it's, it's, it's uh, uh, written in a, in a context in which it, once again, it glosses over any kind of uh, mistake or any kind of mess up on the part of the authors and instead fully focuses on the mission. The Bible continues to have historical documentation and records proved in its existence and authenticity almost every day. In the town of Caesarea uh, Man Matini, the archaeological evidence of Pontius Pilate uh, is, is recorded. So let me just say this. So Pontius Pilate, what we read about in Scripture, is only recorded only recorded, the only time his name is recorded ever in history is in Scripture. So the only reason we knew he existed is from the Bible. But in the past years, they have uncovered a monument that has his name on it. The Pool of Bethesda, mentioned in John 5, 2, there was digging that took place uh, around a spring in this specific area, and as they continued to dig, they uncovered five porticos. It's said to believe that the two pillars that, that Samson was, was bound to have been revealed. And if you were just to get on Google right now and, and, and continue to, to, uh, to research these, you'll see time and time again these opportunities to recognize how God and His Word have been proved and affirmed through archaeological finds. And that third point is this, under corroboration, continuous archaeological discoveries overwhelmingly reveal a consistently accurate historical validation of Scripture. So why should we trust in Scripture? The New Testament authors cared enough to embarrass themselves and even die for the truth. There was more authentic and accurate manuscripts than anything else in history. More archaeological finds 
are being made every single day. Now, this is some evidence, and it's the evidence of the, of the cognitive time, of the, of the academic time, of just kind of reading it and, and understanding it and having this cognitive knowledge, but there's something that goes far beyond our, our, our mental capacity to understand the truth of Scripture. It's the recognition that we understand the truth of Scripture through our spirit, through our holistic being of knowing God, connecting with the Holy Spirit through reading of the Word. What I just shared was the setup. This is the sermon right now. So now you can kind of dig in, okay? We've got that out of the way. If you don't believe in the Bible, you do believe in something. We all trust in something. You trust in in small things and large things every single day. And the point there is we all put our trust in something. 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 10, I'm going to read this final charge to Timothy. It says, you, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith and patience, love, endurance, persecution, suffering, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Ithacum, and Lystra, and persecution I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted." While evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know that those from which you have learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Scripture is more than just a simple checklist. In fact, in many cases, when we read Scripture, we engage with God, we recognize here through this, this, this account from Paul to Timothy, this idea, this concept that we will receive, we will experience persecution. And so as we engage in this, how does Scripture, what does Scripture have to do with me, we can recognize that sometimes Scripture is the catalyst for attack, for persecution. That's not a bad thing, because the more we engage with God, the more He empowers us, the more He transforms us. But the recognition there is that the Word is inspired and has transformative powers for you and for me, the way that it's been carried from its original, original authors to this moment, even through a walk through a long journey, still is empowered through the person of the Holy Spirit. God works through Scripture to change, transform, and encourage you and me. Paul's reliance on the God's word here in this living, unchained life, which is an amazing uh, perspective to think about Paul in chains, but living unchained spiritually. No matter what got him down, no matter what persecution he suffered or faced, no matter where he was in life, he still lived unchained spiritually because he engaged in the truth of the word. Timothy knew that he was on the right track because people in his life and the different things that were taking place, the persecution was happening, but also because he engaged in the authority of Scripture. I want to briefly or quickly walk through these five specific things, these five impacts of authority of Scripture and they have in our life. Like the foundation of a house, the foundation of life, the, the foundation we build upon, let us cling to strength and hope in Scripture. The first one is this, Scripture is able to make you wise for salvation. Here it specifically says that we can learn about this concept, this this thing called salvation, this way that God stepped into the world through the person of Jesus Christ and brought an opportunity for you and I to be saved. God is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path so that I might be able to see Him and understand Him and know Him. The Holy Spirit works through it. Number two, Scripture details the salvation that is available through faith in Christ Jesus. I don't know if you've ever been asked by someone else before. Maybe you've asked the question yourself, how do I be saved? How do I, how do I experience salvation? There are specific words in black and white, or maybe even red and white, depending upon what Bible you're using, that embrace or that share this concept, this understanding of what it means to give our heart to Christ 
to turn from our sinful ways and to experience His lasting, unchained life. And so we can experience that cognitively, but also at the same time, the Spirit flushes through us and brings forth this opportunity for us to know Him. Jesus died for sin, period. And without Him, none of the rest of it matters. Number three, all Scripture is God-breathed. That's that's clearly said there in verse 16, that God is the author of all, and the obedient men and women who wrote it down are simply just His scribes. The basis for Christian doctrine is is inspired by Him. Number four, all Scripture is useful for teaching, for helping to understand, to know Him, for rebuking, for bringing forth truth, sometimes even when it might be difficult, for correcting, for bringing forth an understanding of what the truth is, for training in righteousness, so that we may be able to grow in our faith and know Him. And the thing about training is interesting. Training is more than simply just reading it. Training is an action. Training is taking the Word, taking the truth, and putting it into action in our lives. For the Christian, both creed and conduct are rooted in the Holy Scripture that God's given us. Scripture directs both our beliefs and our behavior, our theology and our ethics. And finally, number five, Scripture provides that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. One of the smaller questions, we we had five big questions. We have a bunch of small ones that are peppered throughout that. One of the smaller questions we have uh, that we engage with uh, throughout this, or we are engaging with throughout this series is, what am I here for? How do I walk through this life? That, that, That point there, Scripture provides that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work, points directly, contributes directly to the fact that God has called us for such a time as this to engage His Word and to use it in our lives. A wise man built his house upon the rock. A wise man built his house upon the Word, his life upon the Word of God. The response, the, 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 the thought there is, what are we building our life on? What truth or what, what trust are you placing? Where are you living? What, what in your life would you say is foundational for what you believe? When I was younger, we used to do these things in, in Sunday school called a sword drill. I don't know if you've ever heard of it before. And a sword drill was basically an opportunity for everybody in the class or everybody in the group uh, to be able to, to take a moment and to, uh, somebody would, well, the, probably the teacher in most cases, or if you got it right, you get to be the next person to call it. They would call out a reference. Call out a reference. John 3.16, right? They call out a reference. And the goal for those that were part of the drill was to open their Bible up as quick as they could to that reference and to read that reference. And if you were the first one, then you would win. And you'd either, like I said, you get to be the next person to call. Or maybe you'd get a prize or just the satisfaction of knowing that you're uh, the quickest one or whatever it might be. And, the, and the, the one main point there was to learn your word, right? For us as kids, it was to try to learn where the books of the Bible were. And then when we would read it, we would affirm that scripture. We'd, we'd learn from it. We'd grow from it. And as I was thinking about this specific week, and I was thinking about how we might walk through this understanding of not just cognitively understanding that the, that the scriptures are true, that they are real, and that this is something we can rely on, but how do we allow this to permeate within who we are? How do we literally step forward and allow ourselves to be the, the, the hands and feet of God in response to this fine and perfect gift that God has given us? And as I thought through those sword drills, I couldn't help but realize that there was another thing that I learned specifically through those that was more or less, not necessarily the point, but was more or less just something that was learned uh, subconsciously more than anything else. If you've ever done a sword drill before, you, you know that one of the rules is you're not allowed to, to start early. You can't, you can't start to open your scripture early while they're starting the passage. You've you got to keep the Bible up high like this. You gotta hold it up above your head and then as soon as the passage is read, you can bring it down and you can start to read it. And one of the things that I realized, I recognize, is that when I did this right here, one of the things that happened subconsciously is it brought forth this, this understanding of the authority and where I should elevate and present the gospel. 
This isn't a situation of, oh, let me hide it under a bushel or let me put it here and I get to it when I can. But no, it's the first thing that I go to. It's the thing that I elevate above all else. It's the recognition that this word right here is literally the word of God. It's been granted and given to you and to me freely as an opportunity for us to be able to hear the voice, experience the person of the Holy Spirit. So here's what I want to do to to close out today. And I I know that many of you probably already have a Bible. Maybe you've got many Bibles at your home. I'm not sure what it looks like for you. But here's, here's what I want to do. I want us together to spend a moment as we pray together to affirm our word and our allegiance, and and, and our desire to put Scripture first in our lives. Because ultimately, this is the only thing that's going to bring any kind of change and transformation in our society. This is the window to which God can speak to you and to me. And like I said, perhaps many of you have a Bible at home. Maybe you have several Bibles at home, whether you're reading it or not. Let me just say first, I want to encourage you to today to make that a, 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 a practice, a discipline that you have where you engage in the Word. The second thing is this. I could imagine that in a room this size, especially joining online, that there are many here that know at least one person who don't have a Bible. In the post-Christian world that we live in, perhaps they, 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 they don't even know about uh, Christianity. They don't even know who Jesus is. Maybe they've heard the name before, but it's not something that's really been anything that's been impactful to their life. Maybe you've got someone in your life that you've been praying for for years. Well, this morning, we put Bibles up here on the altar on either side. And we're not going to close with a song. Instead, we're going to close in a time of silence and then prayer. But here's what I want to encourage you to do. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you all to stand. And if you feel comfortable and confident in it, I want you to raise your Bible up as if to say, yes, this is my commitment to this word. Authority above all else. You Maybe you want to hold it out in front of you. However you want to, that posturing is up to you. But at the same time, if you don't have a Bible or if you know someone who doesn't have a Bible, I want to encourage you to come forward and take one of these. And that might be the easy part for you, coming up here and getting one. But the second part of that is that I want you to pray over that person as we pray together. And then I want you to give it to them. And not just say, hey, I got this for you at church. They were giving them away. But maybe take a few moments and and, and grab some scripture out of there so that when you do give this to this person, you can share some truth with them. You can express some love to them. And you can say, hey, look, I want to read along with you. Let's read the the book of John together. Let's take a moment and I want to read something over you right now so that we might allow the Spirit to speak on His own without us even getting in the way, but letting the Word be our guide. And so would you stand with me right now? Would you stand if you're able? And if, and if, you, and if you would like to at this moment, just in a moment, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just, I'm going to, in a, in a posture of, of reverence and a posture of respect, I just want to take a moment. And we're just going to silently stand. And if you want to hold your Bible up, if you want to hold it out in front of you, if you want to, if, if you want to just express it, you can. If you want to, to come to the front and you want to receive a Bible, do so. I'm just going to wait a few moments for our time of response. And then I'm going to close this in prayer. So let us reflect. Let us respond. God, you are faithful. You are just as faithful today in this moment where we gather in this place as you were in the moments where we got the worst news ever, where we were on the mountaintop in the best moment of our lives. God, you are faithful. And we know that for many reasons, but we know it in part because of the fact that you have granted us the opportunity to be able to be in your presence. 
You've granted us your truth. You've granted us in our own language in a way that we can understand your holy word. So God, may we not just right now elevate our word, our scripture above our heads right now as just a a physical thing, but may this be a representation of where scripture places in our life and our priority. God, may we be a reflection of you. May we be, may we embody the truths and and the 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 commands and and God and the unconditional love of your holy word. God, may as we go from this place, especially as the Bibles that are being taken today to be distributed, God, may those scriptures as they are handed out, may they have a formative impact on the lives of others. As we think about individuals in our lives, as we think about friends, family members, co-workers, maybe just somebody that we've embraced a couple of times here and there, maybe engaged with, God, whoever it might be, God, I pray that you would already be breaking down barriers, you'd already be speaking. May they hear your voice clearly and may your word bring forth new life for them. Thank you, God, for the way that you move. Thank you, God, for the way that you still engage even here today. 3,500 years after the first words were penned, your word is still true, and it still brings transformation. God, be with us this week as we go. Help us, God, to know you, to grow in you, and to experience you. We thank you for your faithfulness. Amen. This morning as you go, remember this. In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1.1. Go with God, He'll go with you. You're dismissed. God bless you.